Okay, so we're going to continue our discussion of diagnosis and assessment by turning our attention to um, assessment. And, and here what we're talking about is how do we collect information about behaviors and experiences that allow us to then make a diagnosis. Um, and, uh, you know, so we're going to, this list that you see in front of you, we're going to go through these one at a time. We're going to talk about what they are and how they're useful or what their limitations are, but we're also going to talk about the reliability and validity for each one. Um, and that's an important way of understanding reliability and validity, but also understanding um, the different things that different assessment tools might bring to the table. And so interviews are probably one of the most common ways that we um, get information that helps us to make diagnosis. And there's two different kinds of interviews. There's unstructured interviews and structured interviews. And um, these are typically both used, but typically um, used uh, more prevalently in different circumstances. So in a private practice such as mine, um, uh, mostly we're going to have the use of unstructured interviews. And I do have examples of both of these in the um, in the folder, uh, the video folder. And so if you want to pause after this slide and um, go look at those, that would be a really good idea, or maybe even pause now and go look at those and then come back. Um, but unstructured interviews are um, typically unique to each clinician. So the unstructured interview sample that I have on Blackboard for you guys is um, one that I made up and I, I couldn't even tell you where all the elements came from except that I'm certain that that um, there's different elements from different places that I was trained um, and you know and and they they're unstructured in the sense that there are topics um, that I want to touch on there is information that I want to be sure to gather but how I go about gathering that um, will largely be uh, responsive to the individual conversation that I'm having. Um, if it's not a uniform approach, um, my unstructured clinical interview is likely to look very different than somebody else's. There's elements that are likely to be the same. We're both likely to get, gather history. We're both likely to um, do uh, some kind of mental status exam where we ask about specific symptoms. Um, but, uh, but if somebody talks longer about one topic than another, um, I can just go there. Um, I, you know, I can um, respond in individualized ways to somebody's emotions and comfort during the interview and, uh, and it will feel conversational. Um, and so uh, an unstructured clinical interview, um, that, that is what that is. Um, a, structured a structured clinical interview, by contrast, has a predetermined set of questions. And essentially, there is a script here. Um, and that the strength of the structured interview is the script. And so you really don't vary from the script. Um, and when I say the strength is the script, what I mean is that um, it will, there will be a high degree of consistency um, in, in um, one person giving this structured interview to another person giving it because um, it is a set, um, not just a set of questions, but the wording of the questions. Um, that's what I mean by scripted. The wording of the questions will stay the same regardless of who's performing the interview. Um, and so if we look at these two different approaches, and you will look at those examples, right? Um, if we think about reliability and validity, um, certainly there is higher reliability in a structured interview because it is so consistent. Um, that, and, and so we have high degrees of interrated reliability um, it, that come with structured interviews. And often that might mean that there is more validity. Certainly it is tied directly, most structured clinical interviews are tied directly to the DSM in some way. And in that way, um, they will have validity in terms of how nicely they match the criteria from the DSM. Um, but there are times, I think, when the unstructured clinical interview may give us more validity in the sense that um, we have more of an ability to build rapport with our client. Um, and rapport is the degree to which you form a relationship or at least start forming a relationship and that your client feels comfortable. Um, and, you know, when I, um, I'm always aware the first time I'm going into a waiting room that the person on the other side of that door, uh, if it's the first time they've met me, um, is taking a big leap of faith, right? They have no idea who I am. They're about to tell me very private and maybe painful things about themselves. Um, and they don't know who I am as a human being. They don't know how competent I am as a psychologist. And they're taking this big leap of faith. Um, and I really see my job in that first session. Primarily, it is to gather information, uh, or at least the start of information that will let me um, diagnose and help this person. 
But it is also my job to make them comfortable. Um, and, and certainly it is my job to make them comfortable enough that they can be honest and open with me. And I think the unstructured clinical interview wins there, that the structured clinical interview feels like you are getting um, a script. It feels like you somebody is reading from a script to some extent. Um, and um, I, I think that just pulls maybe for less openness, or at least that the unstructured clinical interview pulls for more openness. Um, so take a look at those examples. And I'll be happy to answer questions about them, and especially about my unstructured interview if you have them. Um, okay, so the other way that we can gain information is through personality inventories. And again, there's a linked example uh, back on our lecture video uh, page. Um, there's uh, it's, it's a link to a website that shows you um, a personality inventory. It actually doesn't show it to you. Um, it actually gives you the opportunity to take it if you like. And those of you that have been in my theories of personality class um, will have already done that and will be familiar to you. Um, sometimes these are pen and paper. Often and more often uh, lately they are computer delivered. Um, and these are just sets of questionnaires and they're asking the person directly um, how they feel. And this is one example of a self-report measure, right? So I'm saying personality inventories, but self-report measures um, of various kinds, including um, depression inventories or suicidality inventories, are simply asking the person very direct questions about how they feel. Um, and about behaviors they've engaged in and experiences that they've had. Um, one example, another example of a self-report is a life stress index. Um, and these indices um, really are looking to see what um, is going on in the person's life recently. And so typically they're asking questions about over the last year. Um, I did provide examples of those. The two examples I provided, one is the, um, the um, typical life uh, stress index and then I also put one up that is um, created for college students. So um, so those of you that are traditional college age and traditional college students um, may find that some of the uh, items on the traditional one aren't relevant to you so much, um, but that the stresses in your life look different. So take a look at both of those. Um, and here when we talk about reliability and validity, um, right, that, that these tend to be fairly reliable in the sense that um, they're asking fairly straightforward questions that uh, ask for straightforward answers. And so the answers to these questions um, don't change much unless behaviors and experiences change, which we would then we would expect the answers to change. Um, validity is tends to be good with these. Um, however, um, the, the biggest issue with self-report inventories of any kind is whether the person chooses to lie or to be honest. Um, and people often, um, you know, don't feel obligated to be very open um, when they're not being prompted to by a human being. Um, and so that is the biggest threat to validity here. Projective tests um, are psychoanalytic tools. Uh, so we go back to that psychoanalytic paradigm. Um, they're based on something called the projective hypothesis. And the projective hypothesis says that if I give you an ambiguous or unclear stimulus, something to look at, um, that you will project, you will put on it um, something from your unconscious. So this goes directly back to that psychoanalytic paradigm that we were talking about last chapter. Um, and essentially people will reveal unconscious content um, by doing this. Um, and so let's see if we can do this easily here. Um, we could find a Rorschach example. Uh, let's see what my internet connection is like. Right, um, and so this is an example of a raw shot card, and the raw shot cards um, are ink blots. Um, they're ambiguous in the sense that they're not meant to look like any one thing. Um, and you ask the person, you give them this card, and you ask the person, what might this be? Um, and um, they can give you as many answers as they would like. Um, after they tell you what it might be, you do ask them to show you, help you see it the way they see it. Um, and so there's all kinds of things. It's very common for people to see, for example, here, two women dancing, um, or sometimes people will say it's one woman with this being her waist, right, and then her feet down at the bottom. Um, people sometimes turn it on its side and see pigs with a snout here at the top. Um, and a big ear here. Um, so, um, but essentially, um, when we're doing this, and we'll come back here. Sorry. All right. And then the other example of a projective test is the TAT or the thematic apperception test. Um, let's see if we can. There we go. Oh, it's being a little slow for me. Not 
Metro Y. Um, and that's an example of a TAT card. Uh, these you can see are still ambiguous in the sense that you don't know necessarily what's happening here, but they are actual pictures. Uh, so a little less ambiguous in that way. Um, and this prompt here is that you'd like the person to tell you a story, and the story should have a beginning, a middle, and an end. Um, and so then they tell you a story about what they think is happening here. And again, the assumption is that the story they tell you um, is um, indicative of their own interpersonal struggles of some kind in a way that might be outside of their consciousness. All right, that worked better. Um, and so if we think about reliability and validity here. Um, the reliability and validity both tend to be fairly low for these, and it's about the subjective nature both of what the person is telling you, but also about the interpretation that the therapist or the uh, assessor then needs to make about their answers. Um, there are scoring manuals that try to make this a little bit more objective, but in the end, these are all very subjective. Um, and subjectivity is always going to decrease reliability and validity. And then finally, um, we use brain imaging sometimes to collect information, not as often as people sometimes imagine um, we do. There's no easy way to look at a brain and see if somebody has uh, most of the diagnostic categories that we're going to talk about. Um, and so it would seem like this would be a purely objective tool um, if it was widely available to us, but we still get a lot of subjectivity because um, somebody has to interpret the images, um, and there is a lot of subjectivity in that interpretation. Um, and so uh, in that way, um, uh, reliability can be low. Um, if we can get reliability high enough, then validity obviously is very high um, because it is an objective image, um, but it is about that skill set and interpretation. Um, so you guys, right, um, are going to do your group work that looks at the differential diagnosis steps, and we'll have our live discussion about that.